Kia ora tato. Thank you very much for coming to the session on uh, digital literacy and digital citizenship. Uh, my name is Dave Moskowitz, and I have uh, the unique distinction of not being a subject area specialist in this area. And yet, I am your session facilitator, so I'll be able to provide some neutrality for you in terms of keeping the conversation on track. Just in terms of my own background, um, I'm uh, one of the IT geeks who uh, is on the Internet New Zealand Council, and I'm also one of the people on council who is continually pushing uh, to widen the scope of what Internet New Zealand does uh, from only looking at the, uh, you know, the pipes and uh, the network architecture which makes the internet uh, go in New Zealand and the domain name system, which is our, our primary source of income, out to as wide as we can in society, supporting the development of the internet in New Zealand and how well uh, it can affect the lives uh, of people in New Zealand in a positive way. I'm also a citizen of New Zealand. You might not be able to tell that by my accent. Uh, I'm sorry, I've only been here since 1982, uh, so I'm a recent immigrant. Um, but uh, but I, I am very much a citizen. I'm very committed to New Zealand society, and uh, I have children who've been through the school system. And all around me, I see the effects of the, uh, of the importance of people being able to understand how to think for themselves and evaluate information uh, on the internet as they're receiving it. So uh, one of the bits of homework that I did this morning uh, for the session was uh, I, uh, I talked to my son, who's a high school student at Wellington High, and asked him, hey, what do they teach you, what do they teach you about, uh, about digital citizenship in, in, uh, in class at Wellington High? And I was, I guess, a little bit surprised to find that there was no formal instruction, really, in terms of how to evaluate information, how to understand the information that you're getting, how to participate responsibly as a digital citizen. Um, my son went on to talk about uh, the proxy servers that they have at Wellington High and how they block information to uh, things like the Dictionary of New Zealand Sign Language and a bunch of other uh, nefarious sites. Um, and I thought to myself, well, gosh, when, when, when these guys get out into the real world, you know, all of a sudden there's going to be no proxy servers and no one holding their hands and keeping them from information and no one telling them how to behave online. So for me, the central question as a citizen is, how do we teach kids and, uh, and other people in society who are unfamiliar uh, with the digital milieu to uh, understand and process uh, the information and produce information on the internet uh, that are part of our daily lives. So in preparation for this session, I pose the following questions in the program. Um, how are digital literacy and digital citizenship taught and learned in real world environments? How do we train learners to think and understand the context in which they're evaluating information? What strategies are primary and secondary teachers finding successful in providing experiential learning in this area? How are refugees, seniors, and digital newbies acquiring the skills that they need to be responsible digital citizens? And so um, to get the conversation going, because I'm not a subject area specialist, I've asked two really highly qualified people to get the conversation going. And um, the first one is uh, Claire Amos, who uh, is uh, very involved in the digital citizenship teaching community nationally, uh, but who herself is a teacher at uh, Epson Girls, so I'd like to uh, welcome her up. And while she's coming up, I just wanted to say, um, during the session, we would like to be able to film the sign language interpreters as well as the people that are talking. So when you talk, I would invite you to please come up uh, after, uh, when, 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 the, when the session is open to the floor, please come up, stand next to the interpreters here, start off with your name, with your organization. If you're working on a project or in a milieu in the digital citizenship, digital literacy area, please tell us a little bit about that and then go on and pose your question or, uh, or comment to the group. So on that, I'll uh, hand over to Claire, thank you. Thank you. Am I allowed this one? I stole this one. <laughs> I 
Hi, um, my name's Claire Amos. I'm the director of e-learning at Epsom Girls Grammar School. And um, I've just got a, I've been invited to just come speak a little bit about what we've been doing in this area and um, a project that was kicked off um, a couple of months back that we're hoping to get more people involved in. Um, and that project was um, a digital citizenship course being created and made available to all New Zealand students. And for that to be available to both um, secondary school, school students and primary school students alike. But um, I wasn't an interested in trying to go about this alone. So this was actually born, you know, thanks to the beauty of technology. Um, I was sitting poolside at my daughter's swimming lessons, who are sort of six and eight, and I'm sitting there going, oh, sh you know, we, we really need to do something about digital citizenship at our school. We'd given it a couple of nudges. We'd sort of, you know, they deal with it in a... Um, the digital tech class and a unit there. Um, we just had a go at getting tutor teachers to start dealing with it across the um, whole school in tutor time and we struck issues with um, trade union agreements and what tutor time is supposed to be for and if it should be teaching time or not. You know, I sort of went to some heads of department and said, hey, you know, where, where, is this, where does this exist? Where do we explicitly teach our students about digital citizenship, digital literacy and developing their digital competencies? And, you know, the real answer is we'd like to think it's all in the context of the learning you're doing every day. But the reality is our teachers are not equipped at this stage to do that. They actually don't know where to start. And um, so I sort of thought, okay, so I can, what can I do? I can come up with a course for my, our students that we run. And then I realised that I, by myself, did not have the knowledge you know, and here I am as a director of e-learning, probably more equipped than most in our school, didn't feel like I was the right person to be doing this. So I suddenly thought, hey, wait a minute, you know, why, why are we doing this just in our school? Why aren't we making this available and doing it nationally? You know, why isn't the government doing something about this? Well, you know, that's a long-term project. But in the meantime, what's stopping us actually getting on and doing something about this myself? So I'm involved in um, one of Paul Seiler's communities he set up, the um, MLE, Melanchthon learning environment listserv, and I thought, well, there's some like-minded folk right there. Why don't I throw this idea out to people and go, hey, I've got an idea. I'd really like to um, go about co-constructing an online digital citizenship course, and um, I'm just wondering if anyone might be interested. Within 12 hours, I had over 30 people from up and down the country, including people from NetSafe, um, National Library, some ministry people, ex-ministry people, people in a core education that all put their hand up and went, yep, no, sign me up. Where do I, do, you know, where do we contribute? And to me, that signaled that, that there was a real need, but there was a real desire for people to come together and co-construct something meaningful. So all it actually involved was, in the first instance, sending out that email. In the second instance, I set up a Google Doc that um, was open to anyone to edit that had the um, link that's still open for anyone to edit um, that has the link and will continue to be so, and basically said, okay, signal your interest and throw some ideas down here. And from there, it has evolved into a Google group where there's now a listserv where people can discuss the ideas. And we're about to, um, there's been, if I'll quickly just scroll you through what's been happening so far on the Google Docs. So, what you see here is the initial introduction that I just sent out to people saying, here's a vision, here's an idea, give it a nudge, tell me what you think. Um, I haven't got the answers about the right platform, or, um, but I do have some ideas about a time frame and how we could go about this and said it was all open to discussion. And then simply it was just a matter of saying, okay, signal your interest, signal your level of interest, your areas of expertise and what you might like to do. And over time, we had all these people putting up their hand, giving their ideas, and um, sharing their resources and what have you. So you can see it's growing and growing and growing. So we're at the point now where um, I've taken on the role as the person that's driving the pro process. I certainly don't um, plan to be the one writing the ultimate resource. We're at the point where we're just pooling ideas. There's a um, junior and intermediate one forming, which is um, developed on from the idea of just an initial primary but focused one and a senior focused one. Um, we're at the point now where we're planning some face-to-face -face meetings um, this term to try and move it forward. Our aim is to make everything available on Wiki Educator as Creative Commons resources that any schools can pick up, remix, 
make it work for their own school, because this is not a one-size-fits-all project. But we also plan to um, launch next year a Moodle course that any student in New Zealand can enrol and participate in over the course of Term 1 and then review it and again offer it up in Term 3 next year. So offering a pick up and use resource, but then also saying that that's not what everyone wants to do, that we will also offer up um, a set of resources that will be available for anyone to add to, take away, pick and mix and reuse to their purposes. So I mean, I'll make available the link to these resources at some stage, and if anyone wants to learn more, get involved, you can either contact me through Twitter, Claire Amos NZ, contact me by my email, um, or just come in and join the Google group or the Google Doc. I could keep going for ages, but I'm going to stop. Thanks. Thank you, Claire. So this is a great example of collaborative content generation uh, where uh, anyone can get involved in creating a course and sharing material uh, through a Creative Commons license. Absolutely fantastic. Her Twitter ID is Claire Amos NZ. Uh, and I think, uh, do you have an easy to remember email address, Claire? Excellent, am at eggs.school.nz. Thank you. Now, the next person I'd like to come up and talk is uh, Kath Tafifirangi, who works for Core Ed, and um, she has been involved in teaching digital literacy and digital citizenship uh, in, among other places, uh, Kura Kopapa, who have a unique set of challenges. And uh, Kath, would you like to come up and, uh, and tell us a little bit about what you're doing? Thank you, Dave, for the opportunity to share a story. You've already got me timed. Oh, my God, I've got a hurry. Um, quick background. I'm, for the last five years, I've, I've walked in two worlds, I suppose. Point five is DP at Te Rafanui Kura Kaupapa Māori in Lower Hutt and point five uh, for core education in a very uh, privileged position of being an ICT PD national facilitator. So while I've been able to move around the country and see uh, the wonderfulness that's happening in our schools um, from the top to the bottom of, the north of, of, the, of New Zealand, I've then snaffled a whole lot of stuff and thrown it straight back into the classroom with our, our senior tamariki and also the staff room. Um, and basically said, here you go, kids. I mean, I, I, year seven at Kura was the year that English was introduced as a subject, and it was optional. And it also involved pretty much spending a lot of our time online, so there wasn't one Fano that said no, funnily enough. Uh, so all of these students came in. Uh, it was English, uh, ICT, and um, thinking strategies, which I think was just a really fancy name for playing with them. Uh, more and more it became less about me at the front, sometimes I was to the side, and, and quite a few times I was at the back of the room. Um, so taking them into an online forum, uh, something new, because all of a sudden their learning was exposed, and they were very used to just working uh, quietly by themselves, or not quietly, but certainly not exposing their learning uh, so much that they you know, became used to in the end. So one of the things we started with was, what's in your name? Who are you? And I'm sure it's no different in any other classroom around the world, and, and, and here, of course, that when our darlings come into the room, there's a whole whānau, there's a whole iwi that sits behind them. So one of the ways of, of rather than getting them to recite their whakapapa, for example, because they know that, it's a kura. They knew that before they came at age five. So something slightly different was, what's in your name? And all of a sudden, you get this wonderful big picture as to who they are, where their names have been gifted from, and how um, they were a gift and a treasure that arrived in a fado somewhere. So even getting a sense of that was really, really important. And then inviting them to put it into an online forum, a bit like what Claire was saying in a Google Doc. Um, and I had to model, and I'm not going to go there, but my middle name I've never quite got over. Um, I'm slow to get over it, but I had to put it out there um, and let them see what, this, what that was all about. So they... You know, it was about creating a scene or, or a space that was going to be really safe for them. The other thing we did was we talked about how we like being treated. So the first darling says, with respect. 
the next one says with respect, and I'm standing there going, oh, here we go, 25 respects are gonna pop up. And they did. So we went round the other way and said, what does that respect look like? And stories like, uh, people not laughing at me when I'm talking. People looking at me when I am speaking. Someone asking to share my lunch as opposed to assuming it's gonna be a far no time and they can take it anyway. Somebody asking to borrow my, my coloured pens. All of these stories became pictures that ended up being our tikanga, I suppose, our norms of when we were together and also online. We talked about valuing everyone's voice. We talked about not interfering with, the, with each other's work when we were on there. Um, the other important thing was I said to them, I need to be able to trust that when I walk away you're going to manage yourself really, really well online. So we talked about what managing ourselves really well online looked like. Um, and we, we agreed, I suppose, that there was good, bad and ugly. And if you chose to do ugly, there was a consequence. Uh, that this was something that was co-constructed, nothing to do with me. So I said, if, for example, I happen to walk past you and you're quickly slapping the lid on your laptop down, I'm going to think in my head, head mm, that's one. Because if it happens again and it gets to three, you are going to be offering me your device for a week or so, which was going to absolutely kill them to revert back to pen and paper. And I wouldn't say that we were in a digital classroom per se, but there was very little pen and paper going on. So it came down to self-management. Um, and the other really important thing I think about now was I would say to them, if I'm not in the classroom or, or if you're not quite sure, just think, if you have your kroa and your queer sitting either side of you about now, would they be okay with what you're doing? And would they be okay if you pushed that send button to see it somewhere else? That often had them stopping and thinking and like, oops, I'll just backtrack a little bit here. And just on a quick personal note, my 22-year-old going on 30, I think every family should have one, by the way, uh, had posted some photos. And it seemed that every photo on her Facebook page had her with a glass of some alcohol beverage or other. So I said to her, just a little thing. Uh, you know your grandmother's quite active online. Do you think that this is going to be appropriate? Uh, she raced to the laptop at that moment in time and pulled them all down. So um, that's about it, I think. Kia ora. Yeah. You know, a lot of, to me, a lot of digital citizenship and how to behave online has its direct offline corresponding uh, feature. I mean, you know, my mother used to always say to us kids, what would the world be like if everybody acted like that? And so, you know, Kath's talking about, you know, when you display behavior online, if you had your koro and your kuya sitting there watching you and doing what you're doing, what would they think? And would you still do it? So um, the next, uh, is someone from Computers and Homes here who'd like to die? Would you like to come talk about uh, what you guys are doing in this area? Kia ora, thank you. Uh, kia ora koutou. Um, you mentioned specifically, David, uh, if anybody was working with refugee communities. And with computers and homes, in the old days when we were on dial-up, <laughs> we were with Watchdog and we had a filtered service. Um, when the, when the programme migrated to broadband, uh, that was no longer an option and we were working more closely with NetSafe anyway and more with a philosophy of good education rather than any, any sort of filtering. We still get requests for it once in a while and, um, and varying opinions around it. Now with the refugee community, uh, computers and homes, that one is uh, funded fl slightly separately and it includes things like family liaison visitor, it includes interpreters and transport and babysitting and stuff like that So to try to remove the barriers for um, people coming to training. And I'm not quite sure how to answer that about what we're doing especially for the refugee communities. We, we try to... Um, put as much education in around keeping the family safe online as possible. And we, we instruct the family liaison visitors to 
check up what the families are doing at home. And it is slightly different also because Computers and Homes normally is from community up. The schools apply to be part of it. They choose their own families and we work alongside them to implement the program. With the refugee program, it is from top down from the Ministry of Education and they are quite prescriptive and more directive in what the computer will be used for. So in the generic Computers and Homes program, nobody would be going into homes and checking the history of the machine. But I believe the family liaison visitors are instructed to do that. Uh, I think the problem mainly being with, with the language barriers that while the parents still come to training before the computer goes home, I would say that in a majority of the refugee households that we serve, once the computer is home, it is very much there for the children's education and I don't know that there would be a lot of monitoring online. So uh, I know it's not a very conclusive, satisfactory answer, but it's a matter of you know, doing the best we can. So um, no monitoring, no filtering, but strong emphasis on education. So can you give them any specific education about responsible use of their computer? There is a, um, a, we do have a curriculum, and there is a whole module on that. Yes. And, but it would be quite basic, what you, would be quite predictable as to what, um, what level that would take. I don't know, we do have um, a coordinator here who is a trainer as well. Um, Sue, would you be willing to speak a bit more about that module on safety online? This is Sue Davidson, who's our regional coordinator for Christchurch City. Kia ora. Um, I, oh, sorry. Um, the... The, the families that we um, train, oh, is that on? thank you. The families that we train um, is slightly different in each region, but basically we will train them over the space of a term. Um, everything to do with basic computer training, which includes um, how to keep themselves safe, the kids safe, um, viruses, all that sort of stuff. Um, personally, I use the NetSafe website. Spend a lot of time on the NetSafe website. Fantastic resource. Oh, I think lots of schools use it as well. Um, so there's a lot. That's where a lot of the training comes from. Um, all of, um, in the different regions, we all do it slightly differently, but that's certainly where I go to NetSafe. So it's a great little advert for NetSafe. If you haven't been to the NetSafe website, I really recommend that you go and have a look. Um, brilliant resource in the classroom as well, and it's, su it's suited for all age groups. Different little websites for each age group. So yeah. So. Um, we do give the families support for, you know, for the, for the following 12 months. They can give us a call or I have a um, community Facebook page and they can ask each other questions or ask me questions. So it's ongoing support. So I'd just like to point out that uh, both NetSafe and Computers and Homes uh, are both part funded uh, through grants uh, by Internet New Zealand. So, um, you know, Internet New Zealand does support this stuff very strongly. And I'd like to just open it up in general to uh, anyone else who's working on a project that they'd like to explain or people who have a, uh, a question or uh, a problem that they'd like to uh, throw out to the floor. So. Um, just uh, don't be shy. Come forward. Please come and stand next to the interpreters as you're talking. Thank you, Dave. <clears throat> uh, good afternoon. I'm Stephen Knightley. I'm the chairperson of the New Zealand Game Developers Association, and I have my own game studio called InGame, and I'm really passionate about making training games, educational games, cultural games, and games that have positive behaviour change. Um, but this hopefully... Um, follows quite nicely from the previous example. About a year and a half ago, I was involved with a not-for-profit group in Auckland called the Life Game Project. And what we did is we refurbished some old computers, partnered with people like the Ark and the like, and we donated them to after-school programs and refugee centres in Auckland. There were some in Avondale and some in South Auckland. And what we did is we did not put educational programs on them. Um, we did not give them the, the NetSafe module. Um, we put video games on there. And, you know, if you're talking about digital engagement and, and digital literacy, the lesson, well, our belief, and I think what we had um, validated in this project is that, yeah, I mean, heck, if you want to get games into, uh, kids into, into computers and ICT, you give them games. 
um, and it was really successful. And um, so, sure, and our point was that um, we vetted some of the games, made sure they were appropriate, but also just in playing these games, there was an awful lot of numeracy, literacy, short-term, long-term, problem-solving, all of those things. Um, and I could talk at length about the educational benefits of these entertainment-based games. But what we found happened um, quite naturally and quite organically is then mum did come along. Um, and mum did start doing her CV um, on the computers. And it was her first experience using the, the word processing software and all those things. So just the experience we had from that is that games turned out to be a really great, I suppose the term I, I use is gateway drug you know, for digital literacy. And um, so yeah, that, that's the opportunity that I see and why I'm passionate about games as a tool for digital literacy. And then to flip it on its side, so some colleagues of mine did a game for um, Transqual, which is the truck driving industry training organisation. It was a 3D simulator where you drive a truck and you've got a heavy load in the trailer unit. And it's all about teaching you how to corner appropriately, not taking a corner too fast, and it's got real physics simulation in it and the truck, the truck will tr trash and all that. And it met all its learning objectives and it was fantastic and great and fine. Of course, the feedback from all the truck drivers afterwards was, oh, yeah, cool, boss, that was really good fun, um, learnt a lot. Where's the level of all the ramps and all the jumps? <laughs> yeah, and that's their digital literacy. It's how they... You put a 3D simulator in someone, they've spent 30 years with a video games console in their living room. They've been in our living rooms for 30 years, since the early 80s. That's the digital literacy we've got. And I'd say, for many kids, the most sophisticated IT use they get is from playing a video game. Um, so that's my pet rant on the, on the topic. One particular ask I have for people at the conference is I am working on a few educational games at the moment and trying to find the best places to align them with the, natural, with the national curriculum. Um, there's lots of opportunities. Um, but I'm kind of looking for some, some feedback from educators' points of view. I'm looking for, is there a particular national standard which has proven difficult to teach using traditional mechanisms that would just be perfectly suited for some electronic zhuzhing. So that's me, thanks. Thank you. Kata. So we should all be programming the next secret level in all of our games with the jumps and so on. Um, I'd like to answer your question, Stephen. Um, I would like you to make games on all the national standards and then that would give me time to teach digital literacy. Um, I think um, assessment, I know, is um, probably a little bit of an aside, but it's actually really, really vital to this whole discussion because um, I think uh, Jacinta said it yesterday, what we measure is what we do. And we don't measure digital literacy. It's not valued um, as far as assessment goes. So... Uh, we, when you're in a primary school and you are measuring reading, writing and maths, um, and for each of reading, writing and maths there's probably 40 standards and there's 40 weeks in a school year, um, there's not a lot of time to get into the other great stuff that we would rather be doing. And yes, there are innovative teachers that can do both, but when we're in this situation where the things that are... Um, valued at face value are uh, traditional areas, it's, it's very difficult to teach digital literacy. And then when we get to the point with assessment again where our kids are taught to collaborate, they're taught to work in teams, they're taught to work um, and talk and um, be noisy in their learning and ask questions, and then we assess them by giving them a um, multi-choice fill-in-the-bubbles test. Um, and they get really confused because when they write a story, they're used to talking to their friends about it. Then we give them, then we assess them and stick them in a room in silence for 45 minutes. So while we're teaching all this digital literacy stuff, I hate the word digital literacy, um, while we're teaching all that stuff, we're not assessing it. And it's just it's going out the window, and I, and I think it's a real tragedy. The other side of um, digital literacy, uh, we've talked about safety quite a bit and behaviour, is um, the Creative Commons stuff as well. And that's a really important part of being digitally literate and being a citizen in the digital world. And again, we have another barrier there where... Um, our Board of Trustees actually own all children's and teachers' um, intellectual property and it is all licensed under an all rights reserved licence. 
and that can only be changed, uh, that is the default. So that can only be changed if a board of trustees creates a Creative Commons policy that then undoes that. And we, um, how many schools have we got? 2,000, I think, was what was quoted. There are two schools in New Zealand that have a Creative Commons policy out of 2,000. Um, and it's even with the most passionate educators who are very passionate about Creative Commons, it is very difficult to um, both educate your principal and your board about what Creative Commons is, to open up the conversation, to then have the discussion, to then write a policy which then gets approved when the priority is whether or not the kids are wearing sun hats as a policy. So we've got all that going on at the same time as well. Um, so what we're asking, if I can say we, um, is that somehow can the default for content be changed at a higher level so the default is Creative Commons and then if a school has a genuine reason for needing an all rights reserved kind of licence, then they can make that change. Because education is about sharing and it's about teaching our kids to be digital citizens and we can't do that if... Um, Technically, when I share something with the school down the road, I'm actually breaching copyright. So at the risk of straying too far off topic, uh, Tara, is it possible to uh, have a, a Creative Commons sort of template policy that you've developed for your two schools and you just sort of blast that out to the rest of the 2,000 schools uh, around the country? So that we don't have to reinvent the wheel in every school? Um, yeah, that, that exists. That um, sits on Wiki Educator. But the issue is having the conversation with the board to say, hey, we need a, can we use this Creative Commons policy? What's Creative Commons? Well, Creative Commons is, and then, then there's um, you know, worries about what if we invent this really amazing thing and could make money off it? And Yeah. So it does. Hi, um, I'm Rob. I'm the manager of the Any Questions service. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Any Questions, what it is is a free online reference service for New Zealand school students. We're funded by the Ministry of Education, and um, what we do is we teach students information literacy skills. Um, we don't give them the answers, and um, so that's a core part of what we do. Um, we're staffed by librarians from right around New Zealand. Um, what we find with students when they come into the site is that they, you know, you, you'll unpack the question with the students to find out what they know. And you might talk about a site like, uh, are, you, are you familiar with Tiara? Because it might be a New Zealand question, it might be a perfect place to start with it. And they go, yeah, I've been to Tiara, it's crap. They say that to us, and it's like, but that's because they don't go to the other pages. They don't know how to read below the fold. There's those basic kind of things, and there's a lot of assumptions that we find with students that, well, teachers that assume that students know how to find information online because they, they're online all the time. Well, they don't. They don't actually get taught those skills, and that's what we find with any questions. And, I mean, we, uh, w w there is a huge demand for what we're doing. I mean, we've been around since 2005, and um, this year we've already broken our record for the uh, two busiest days that we've ever had. Um, we did that in uh, May, June. We're 65% up on what we did last year in terms of the... So there is a demand coming in for what we actually offer. And what, one of the things that we've brought in this year is we've um, introduced formal class demonstrations. And um, with those, what we do is we book a whole class. They show it on a data show. Um, and they engage with the librarian and we introduce information literacy, how to tell what an appropriate website is, all those kind of things. So we, we, we do that with skills and we've reached, and, and that's probably where the future of our service lies because at any one time, because of staff commitments, I can have at most at the moment seven operators on in an hour. Now if you have 30 kids coming at once or wanting individual help, we're going to reach them all, but you know, it might be 20 minutes before they're seen. So if we can, kind of, we're trying to do ways to maximise that reach to um, students and classes and help the education sector. But, you know, that's things that we've got. We also have uh, another part of our site, uh, another part of our service is Many Answers. Um, Many Answers is like an FAQ. Um, it's got literally about 900 entries on there that follow an information literacy approach. We don't, despite it's been called Many Answers, we don't give them the answers, but we just... Um, basically give them 
stuff about, look, this is how you use the site kind of thing, and, and where to go for information. And with the online transactions that we do with students, quite often we, um, we simply talk through the questions with them um, and, and, and guide them to appropriate places to go. So, yeah, anyway. Before you run away, uh, just say the URL. Uh, the URL. Uh, the so yep, read. it's uh, anyquestions.co.nz. Uh, manyanswers.co.nz is our uh, other site. So, um, yeah, anyquestions.co.nz, and then there's got links to our other sites. We also have a Tereo site called Uyana Pato. Uh, that operates on an appointment basis. Um, the reason it operates on an appointment basis, as opposed to any questions, which is open Monday to Friday, 1 to 6 p.m., is... In the history of it, we used to have it open every day, 2 to 3 o'clock. Um, in the history of any questions where we'd had 55,000 transactions in English, at the same time, we had six transactions in Tereo. They just don't want to engage in that live online chat in that space in that fashion, so it wasn't really appropriate. So on uh, Many Answers, we have, uh, I think it's about 4% of the content on Many Answers is in Tereo. Um, so, and that's an area where we're adding content all the time as well. Cool. Fantastic. Thank you. So who knew, who knew that we had Quora for students being developed right here in New Zealand? It's absolutely fantastic. So um, you can go through the notes from our room uh, in Z3 and, uh, and get those URLs and visit those sites. Um, hey, I'm Matt McGregor from Creative Commons Aotearoa New Zealand. Um, I want to thank Tara for bringing this up. Um, we do have template Creative Commons policies up on the site and up on Wiki Educator, so there are links at the new Creative Commons site for these policies. Um, there's also a longer document that I've put together, which is a, still a draft template, um, which roughly looks to sell this issue to boards of trustees. Um, I'm, that's still in development. I'm not a teacher, so I've done my best to sell it. Um, I would appreciate any teachers in the room having a look at that document and emailing me and um, giving me suggestions and um, we'll continue to make resources. I have some time to make resources if you ask me to do that, so get in touch with me. Um, we can work together um, to get more schools um, than just Albany and Warrington adopting Creative Commons policies. Um, we want to get closer to 2000 than two, right? So um, yeah, get in touch. Cheers. All right, anyone else want to come up and, and share with us? Thanks. Um, my name's Dave Lane. I have a uh, wacky idea I'd like to try out on this audience that is re related to digital citizenship. Um, just to give you an idea of my credibility, um, which is basically none, I didn't go to school in New Zealand. I have children who haven't started school yet. Um, I don't actually know all that many uh, you know, people involved in schools, but I run a business that is really aching for finding good people coming out of schools, and I can see that the pending skill shortage is going to cause us all a great deal of trouble in the in the long term. So I've been trying to think about this for quite a while. Um, upon coming to New Zealand, um, I was very struck by the institution of um, uh, surf lifesaving, and it struck me as an amazing kind of a institution to have in a community whereby young people could engage in something outside of the school framework, they could have fun with their friends, but they could also be learning things, they could also be um, learning in the importance of engaging in community service, and so basically providing something to the community that was constructive rather than maybe getting themselves into mischief and into trouble instead. Um, what I've been trying to work out is, uh, I've actually been sitting in on the MLE mailing list that many of you are probably on, and um, I've seen a, a lot of people talking about how the new standards um, are putting teachers in a very difficult position because they don't feel that they're actually qualified to uh, keep up with the technology changes and they're, they're not easily able to engage their students on all of the areas that they're meant to be, um, you know, that they're meant to be uh, uh, developing new skills in and um, they, they just don't feel that they're qualified. They need professional development. That's, that's what I keep on saying, PD, PD, PD. Um, so what I'm actually wondering is, is there any reason why we can't be learning from the students instead rather than the other way around? And that teachers actually become 
uh, a, a guide. They provide the wisdom as to doing things that aren't illegal, perhaps, but, but beyond that, what they act as is facilitators for self-directed learning, because as we all know, IT is not really a subject unto itself. It's another set of tools that people can use to follow whatever passion they have in whatever field it might be. And what I'm wondering is, would it be possible or would it be crazy for us to consider setting up something like Surf Lifesaving, but for IT? So that, for example, facilities in schools that are sitting dormant outside of school hours could be made available with minimal supervision from somebody who just keeps the students from doing something illegal. Um, so that the students can go in with their friends, with their peer groups, and they can literally just play. They can see what the technology allows them to do, and they can see what, um, wh where their interests lead them. They can basically follow the, the references and the resources that they have on the internet. Th these might also be third places that are outside of the schools as well. I don't know, maybe, maybe on Mirai, for example. Um, but the idea is that, that it's a place where people can test their skills, they can develop social relationships, they can also engage with the community. I would see that there would be a service component in this as well, where students that are involved in these programs would be encouraged to, for example, provide IT support. So the secondary students maybe could provide IT support for primary schools who, as, I can, as far as I can tell, suffer from not being able to get good support. But we know from the examples of Albany High School, for example, that um, the students are more than capable of providing that level of support and probably better than people that you could pay lots of money to as well. And they could do it as a way of, of honing their own skills. And who knows, maybe what we might even find is that some of these students, maybe only a few in any given community, will actually become the people who start the next big IT companies, the ones that actually um, go beyond being consumers of technology and instead become creators. And they, instead of, instead of forcing us to mold our culture to the technology, we have the skills to mold the technology to our culture. Hello there, uh, my name is Ben and I'm a student at Wellington High School and um, I'm not currently employed in any tech related, <laughs> any tech -related industry. But uh, just going on what uh, Dave was saying about creating something like Surf Life Saving for IT, given my experience with adolescent children, uh, adolescent people, I think uh, <laughs> putting a whole bunch of adolescents in a room and letting them run run wild with computers isn't <laughs> with, uh, with 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 no you know general direction and enforcement shall we say isn't such isn't such a good idea <laughs> I believe in myself <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, I, I think uh, I think employing them in uh, like tech support and stuff for primary schools is, is a fantastic idea, and that it would work great and you know do good work for the community. But I think there would have to be some more uh, hands-on training, as, as opposed to sort of hey, here's a here's a room full of computers, do what you want. <laughs> A component of this is also the idea that, that these kind of organizations could be a, um, uh, a mechanism for people involved in the community, or sorry, involved in the industry, such as myself, could go along and uh, periodically provide mentoring and provide um, glimpses to some of these students as to what it's like to actually work day to day in the industry and actually form those mentorship type relationships for th with people who show a real passion for it. And it, it creates an opportunity for that linkage between industry and community that doesn't, as far as I can tell, exist at the moment. Thanks. Um, I, is there anyone from Computer Clubhouse here? Because, uh, you know, they have a program which on the surface of it seems to fulfill it. Is there anyone here? No. Uh, com, uh, there is an organization called Computer Clubhouse which does fulfill some of these functions and uh, it's worth uh, finding out uh, a, a bit more about them. And uh, while, we're on, while we're on the subject of uh, of, of programs for kids learning about computers. I just wanted to tell Toko uh, to Catalyst IT, who are actually uh, one of the sponsors of the stream uh, at NetUI. Uh, they have a great academy program uh, that they run. It's a bit like a summer school uh, where they uh, take in students. Um, does it cost anything? Is, 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 does it cost anything?
right. Tom, do you want to come up here? Uh, so I get to, to tout uh, the, the Catalyst Summer Ac Academy, which uh, we set up two years ago uh, for high school students, mainly senior high school students. Uh, and basically what we do is um, we go to the schools, we, we outline the sort of topics that we want to cover, which are generally quite technical. And um, the staff at Catalyst, we, we have about uh, half a dozen that volunteer to be, to be tutors. Uh, and they design their courses, and we have about 20 to 24 students come in for two weeks. In the first week, they basically get a full-on computer science course uh, using all the technologies that interest us, uh, which are the sort of technologies that uh, interest Google and Amazon and uh, Facebook and all those sort of companies, so, so very much uh, open source platforms. Uh, and then we put them to work in the second week, uh, working on open source projects in Teams, so those projects have been things like Google, the My Portfolio platform that a lot of you might use, uh, Koha, which is a library management system, uh, Android app and so on. Uh, and so, you know, at the end of the week they've had a, uh, you know, experience on what computer science might look like and then what it might look like uh, applied in, in the workplace. And it's a, it's a lot of fun um, and the, the feedback we've had has been entirely positive and we'll be running it again mid-January 2013. Thank you. I just want to say, you know, you get kids out into the workplace as a way of mentoring them and practicing, you know, responsible uh, computing. Um, you know, workmates aren't going to put up with nonsense, and it's great to get them out into the real world. So there was someone over here who wanted to talk. Um, I'm Lisa Oldham, I work at National Library, and there is one piece to this puzzle about digital citizenship and digi digital literacy, and thinking of Tara talking about how much more can we add to teachers, and if we had a completely different expectation about school libraries, we've got this amazing asset, this network of school libraries and other libraries all the way across the country that is really underutilised. If we completely shift our perceptions about what can happen and who we hire and what we expect to happen in those spaces, we've already got a huge commitment in resource, in people, in skills, in our schools and outside of schools not yet there that are completely able to help with this particular issue. And I think... Um, it's time to start having conversation about how we could really maximize that asset, but it takes a really different approach to thinking about what school libraries are all about. Next. Tim. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Tim. I'm a teacher from Seatoon School. Uh, can I just get a show of hands if you're a citizen? All right, can I get a hand, uh, show of hands if you use anything digital? I think one of the things we need to stop throwing it back on is teachers. We're all digital citizens, and being a citizen is, is being active and participating. Uh, and this morning, for me, it was really neat to go across to the, the parliamentary inquiry. It's the first time I've ever been in something that is a, a key part of, of what we call being part of a citizenry. It was really neat for me to do that. Um, but I think one of the things that often comes back, and it sort of alludes to what uh, Judge Harvey was saying yesterday, is that the whole cyberbullying issue always comes back to schools. And we have to do something about it, even though the majority of those students have signed up on Facebook at home, and then they bring that into the school, and the school is therefore responsible for cyberbullying. And I kind of think, if we're all citizens, which most of us are, and we're all digitally involved, then this isn't the conversation for teachers to take account of or, um, you know, the, the libraries or formal institutions. It's what we're actually saying about what we're doing online and being aware of it. And if we go right back to the keynote from Pamela, you know, hands up if you've read the terms and conditions of Google. Not many, but we all actively participate in that thing. And if we're not actually taking responsibility and, and, and modelling that to our young people and modelling that to each other, then we're not actually really being digital citizens ourselves. So, Thank you, Tim. Follow this man's Twitter feed. Really uh, very uh, high signal to noise ratio. We have time for... Oh. <laughs> Are you coming to talk? Yeah. Okay. Just saying hi. Okay. Um, 
<laughs> uh, hi, I'm, I'm Pete Hall. I'm the Deputy Principal at Upper Harbour Primary School. Um, I'm, I'm really interested in the idea of the Facebook Stadium. So the Facebook Stadium would be the way you would interact with Facebook in such a way that uh, the small blurb that you wrote on your feedback would be surrounded by every face of every person who's following your feed. And perhaps you could do the same with a, with a, a Twitter feed as well. And I think that level of transparency gives us an idea of the difference between how Facebook encourages you to interact uh, and how you are actually being perceived and what's actually happening in the outside world. And so there's room now, for, I think, for a curriculum for, I guess, a consistency or an integrated self, the sense of who you are as a, as a five-year-old to who you're going to be as a 10-year-old and as an adult, and how do those things integrate uh, across to who you are digitally in such a way that you're not tricked through, I guess, the, the psychology of being in front of your laptop alone just typing away your thoughts and what's actually happening and how you're being perceived in the outside world. And I think we are now able to design this ourselves and consider how do we become integrated and how do we allow ourselves to be our authentic best selves online in such a way that we are constructive and collaborative and held to account for who we are. And it's, it's a fantastic opportunity for us to develop as, as individuals and as a society. And it's a wonderful opportunity, I think, in education for us to make that happen. Thank you very much. So that kind of brings us full circle uh, back to uh, Kath's uh, Koro and Kuya are sitting on either side of you and watching what's going on to the Facebook stadium and, you know, constantly being reminded that, yes, the whole world is watching. Uh, this is part of your permanent digital footprint that you're creating for yourself and just get, get kids to, uh, to understand that. I'm afraid we're just about out of time, but if I can get uh, Nat Torkington to come up and be really, really brief. That's great, because there's something else I need to say. Sure. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, I'm... I'm delighted to have connections made between this session and the previous session where we talked about adult cyber safety and uh, the, the scams that people fall for and the mistakes that adults make online. Very similar um, related to the mistakes and, and uh, troubles that children face online. Solving one problem can help solve the other. These are shared interests. Schools have an interest in getting parents into the schools and establishing stronger relationships with the community. This seems like an opportunity, and I'll try it in my local area, to engage both children and their parents at the same time in something that they have in common with the teachers who have to learn this um, stuff at the same time. Uh, if anybody knows of safe Facebooking, to pick the obvious one that um, everybody's curious about, uh, if, if there's such a, a beast, a course online that I can follow, I don't have to reinvent the wheel. I'd love to know. Um, I'm GNAT on Twitter and easily found an email, hopefully, as a result. So uh, please get in touch with me. Thank you. Thank you, Nat. So I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap it up there. It's been a really interesting full session uh, with lots of diverse opinions and people from all aspects of the field working. So um, I'd, like, I'd like to thank you now. But before you go, uh, there are two things that I'd like to put in a plug for. One is the bar camp on Friday. The conversation doesn't need to end here. We can set the agenda for the bar camp on Friday. All you need to do is go up to the booth next to the Internet New Zealand booth and take a sticky post-it note and write your own topic related to either digital citizenship or anything else you want to talk about at a session on Friday. And then we can continue the conversation on that. Now, the second thing I want to put in a plug for is how many people here are members of Internet New Zealand? Put your hands up. Okay, that's good. That's good, but I just want to remind you that Internet New Zealand needs more people as members like the people in this room to help us set the agenda. Uh, it will cost you the grand total of $21 a year to be a member of Internet New Zealand and help participate in that conversation. So if you're not a member, I'd urge you to go away and think about spending $21 a year on helping us with our kaupapa in terms of uh, making this sort of information widely available to the general public and reinforcing uh, the good work that other people have done. So thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure. And we'll see you at the next session.